All right, guys, we're here again, and this video, if you're looking at the top of the screen, you see it's 12.53. I'm actually filming this video before the uh, video for um, Isaiah, but this video is going to be posted after, be posted later this evening. But I wanted to comment on this because I, I went through comments. I saw you guys left some incredible comments. Very, It is encouraging to me because it shows me you're thinking. You're looking at this, and you're considering this, and you're thinking about it. I said in the description of that video, no one is going to be blocked because they share what they think. No, I'm not going to, I'm not looking to block anybody. I want people to share what they think, bring it out in the open because it shows you're thinking about it. And my hope is it'll drive you to the scriptures and cause you to look more. Let me go examine this. Let me see more what this says. Because the whole idea isn't to call somebody out on a false teaching, even though we inadvertently did that, but it was because that was that person. It could have been anybody else. The goal was to address the subject, to bring the subject to light, and to expose this, not just in other people, but in ourselves. How many of us examine ourselves at a random point in our lives during this process called sanctification and find out we're not walking the right path? That's the whole idea, is for us to discover these things within ourselves, turn away from them, and go back to the Lord. No matter how many steps you get away from Him, it's only one to get back. Lord, I made a mistake. Show me the right way. It's that simple. It's that simple. Now, getting into what we were talking about, you can't know a person's heart. I want to make sure that's clear, and I'm not saying you can. But like I commented to somebody on that video, on one of their comments, it will become evident because at the moment of belief, justification comes. When belief comes, there's justification. Justification carries you through the process of sanctification. The sanctification is the action. When you look at the word sanctification and its definition, it, it lists it as a noun, but yet all the definitions underneath it are all verbs. They're all action definitions of doing something. There is an action to this. You can't just say, I believe, sit in a recliner and think everything's going to be fine and not ever do anything. There are going to be actions that are going to follow that belief. That's faith. One person commented, and, and they and I, I pointed it out to him. They said it exactly right. It's the moment a person places their faith in Christ. That's an action. That's a verb. You're actually doing it. I, I place my cup on the table. I place my faith in Jesus Christ. It's an action. You're doing something. And it's not just an acknowledgement of a detail. It's actually something you're doing internally. It's, it's a movement. Now, a lot of people... Want to throw the label backloading works onto this kind of stuff. Backloading works has no application here. And it's a favorite term of a lot of people because they use that as a justification to, one, attack somebody and try to make them look bad. Two, justify what they're doing. Because if backloading works was the issue, then every single video everybody puts out is works. Every single baptism is works. Every single book is works. Every single discussion is works. Because all of that falls under the term backloading. And backloading doesn't even make sense anyway. How are you backloading works? Or are, you, are you pulling a train and you're putting them in the caboose? What's, what, is, what is this term that everybody is so fond of using? It's irrelevant and it's stupid and it's ridiculous. And it's a false attempt at trying to deflect from the reality of what's happening. Because as soon as they say, oh, they're backloading works, everybody's like, oh, I can't listen to them no more. I'm afraid. I can't say nothing no more. Wrong. Challenge the authority. They can jump up and down, holler and scream and spout all the scripture they want. But in the end of the day, it is their opinion when it's not based fully in scripture. I'm backloading works. I don't care. I don't care what you think. The Bible supports what I'm saying. The Bible specifically talks about these things in great detail. And I'm reading those scriptures to the people. So if I'm backloading works, I don't care. I don't care what you think. I don't do this according to what you think I should do. And you don't run your channel according to what I think you should do. You're an adult. You do what you want. And you will pay the consequences for those decisions. I am adult. I will do what I want. And I will pay the consequences for my decisions. That's how it works. That's how it's always worked. However, here's the caveat. When it is evident that somebody else is doing something wrong, it is important that we point that out not for our benefit, for theirs. Now, this whole backloading works and all these other accusations and that, they only come when somebody else says something about what they think. 
It's a response. It's a, it's a direct reaction to what somebody else says. It's not something that they're going out there and saying, okay, so here's what an example of backloading works is. They don't ever sit down and explain what it is. They just use the term. They don't understand what that term means. There is no such thing as backloading works. No such thing. They want to say backloading or frontloading because somebody came up with that term. They don't know what it means and they can't explain to you what it means. And it's not in the Bible. So I'm going to wipe that off the table. That's not, not even, we're not even going to talk about that. We want the scripture. What does the scripture tell us? And I'm going to bring you to Jude 1. And I want you to keep in mind as we're reading this, and we've read it before, but in this context it's different. Some of these people that, this, that Jude is talking about, they don't even know they're doing this. This is why we warn. It's for their benefit. It's so they can stop and look at it and examine it instead of just instantly reacting to somebody saying, hey, this is what this person said. And their immediate reaction is violence and attacks. See, nobody came to me and, and reacted to me for me to violently respond in the video last night. First of all, I didn't violently respond. Second of all, I had nothing to do with it. I'm doing what the scripture says. See, two other people besides Lepa had come to me in the last five months about the same subject involving the same person. That video wasn't about that person, it was about the subject. It's the subject we have to address, but instantly everybody wants to turn it into something about the person. The person is irrelevant. I am irrelevant, they are irrelevant, you are irrelevant. It's the doctrine. That's what we have to talk about. And that's what we have to stay focused on. Like I said, in that video, people have been expressing their opinion. I haven't blocked anybody. I'm not going to. Because the whole goal is to get people to stop and think about it. And take a look at the people they're listening to that they look up to as authorities and look up to as, as their faith leaders and examine what they're doing. And the Bible tells us to do that because they are Humans, and they are fallible. They can make mistakes too. And many, many times, as the Bible implicates, the narrow path and the wide path look very similar, and it can be very hard to, to find out which one we're on. And a believer, uh, it says, the Bible says it multiple times. Christ himself gives warnings about this. A believer can find himself on the wrong path and not know it. This is why we have to examine ourselves. This is why the Bible says to examine ourselves. Examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Because if you don't, you can find yourself somewhere you really don't want to be. It's so easy to get pulled back into the world. The Bible warns against it. The letters to the churches, read them. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it tells you this. Christ warns, get out of the world, get back into your first love. And if we don't talk about this, if we don't bring it out in the open, how is anybody ever even going to know? Because all I ever hear is, rapture and God loves you. 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 Don't listen to that person. They're a heretic and backloading works. Rapture, God loves you. Rapture, God loves you. Rapture, God loves you. They're going to build the temple. They're signing the agreement. There's war over here. Rapture, God loves you. Rapture, God loves you. Rapture, God loves you. That's all I ever hear. They never talk about the hard subjects. That's a problem. Somebody's got to do it. Well, if I'm the one that's got to be the sacrificial lamb in this case, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Kill the sacred cow. That's what we're, that's what we're going to do. So now we're going to go into Jude here, and I'm going to read you what Jude says. Now, in the context of that video last night, in the context of what we're talking about, listen to what Jude has to say. This applies to the situation. Greeting to the called. He addresses his letter. It's, his letter is to the called, those that are saved, those that are born again. I'm talking about real Christians. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Notice there's action words being done there. There's action on God's part and Christ's part. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I find it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. That's an action. Contending, that's an action. That's a word that means doing something. What contending to the faith we are? I'm doing it right now. By going over these subjects and talking about these truths, I'm doing it right now. By sharing the warnings that are given in the Bible to believers, that's contending for the faith. It's right there in the scriptures. You don't have to like it. It's still there. You don't have to like it. It's still the truth. So that's what we do in action. You're acting on your belief. Uh, yes, I believe Jesus is the son of God. Okay, well, what are you doing about that? I'm going out there sharing the truth with people, trying to get them to see. 
action. And that's just one. Verse 4, this is the key one. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Why are they unnoticed? Well, they're not dressed like Satan. They don't have horns growing out of their head. Why are, they, why are they unnoticed? Because they look like everybody else. They have the same confession as everybody else. There is nothing outward that you can identify that sets them apart from anyone else. But they are marked out for condemnation. These are ungodly men, yet they're standing in the church. He's warning them about this. Who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you have going on today. Now, right away, a bunch of other channels will say, oh, Mr. Christians, he's one of those people. How is that the case? When I'm the one willing to come out and talk about this and nobody, almost, almost no one else is, very few people will do this because it brings a lot of hatred. It brings a lot of negative attention. And again, it's not a personal attack when they attack you over stuff like this. It's not a personal attack. They're attacking God. They're not attacking you. You just happen to be the one they're aiming it at. See, when Satan fires his arrows, he can't aim or to flip. I can, well, I used to be able to. I used to be able to, at 40 yards, shoot the, an arrow through the cap of a water bottle. Satan, he just aims blindly in every direction and starts firing arrows. He doesn't know how to aim. And so sometimes when he's trying to hit God, he hits us. It's the way it is. But this is all the more reason for us, number one, wear the armor in Ephesians 6, live it every day. Number two, because that's how you wear the armor, is you live the armor. Number two, uh, there's people that are in churches. It's so funny. I saw a video where a guy actually went and had a suit of armor made and had those labels <laughs> graved on it, and he was putting it on on a Sunday. Come on, man. You can do better than that. It's not an external superficial response. It's an actual living thing. It's an action that you do. W living that armor every day, living by faith, living by trust, living and acknowledging your salvation. It's an actual thing that you do. It's part of that belief that turns into faith. It's exactly what I'm talking about. These men are going about the business of specifically taking what Christ said and turning it into something else. How much of a somebody's uh, sermon turns into an attack on someone else? How many times does it, the, their, their 45 minute or an hour long video turn into nothing but an onslaught of insults and attacks towards another person when they could be covering what the Bible says? Here it is, right here. The warning against those, those things. They're not interested in what God has. They're interested in what they want. Verse 5, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, listen closely. Everybody needs to pay very close attention and think about this. After he saved them out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. This is a warning hidden in plain sight. And there are people that struggle with this. They struggle with it. Well, how can, how can, how can God do that to his people? I don't know. Maybe because they didn't really believe. Maybe because they weren't who they said they were. Maybe because they had a false confession. Notice at the very end of verse 4, notice what it says there. Old and new apostates. Now Jude is giving you an example of old apostates and he's going to bring it up into our time. After God saved his people out of the land of Egypt, after that he killed them, the ones that didn't believe. Verse 6, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Angels in heaven who saw God with their own face, they knew nothing else but him, still did not want what he had to offer. James 2 says the angels believe and shudder. Why can't they be saved if Jesus died for all sin? He died for all sin, all of creation. How is it? That, G, that they can't go. They don't want it. Sure, they believe in Jesus, but they don't want what he has to offer. We have people alive today. You know people today. Yeah, I know Jesus is real. I, I know he's the son of God. I don't want what he has to offer. I want my life. But I want to wear that title because that title gives me a, a lot of extra perks. That's what they're doing. How can we not know this? How can we not see this? This is Jude is warning us about this. Angels are going to be destroyed. 
Verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, the Bible warns all believers, stay away from this. How many believers are still involved in this? Hello? I've seen them, in, I sit in the back of the church on purpose. I've seen them looking at porn on their phone in church on Sunday. That is not an exaggeration. I've seen it. Yeah, they call themselves a Christian. How is that possible? See, that's not good fruit. You're sitting in the house of worship for the Lord and you're looking at pornography? Excuse me? What an insult. Well, here's an example of it right here. You know Sodom and Gomorrah was within Israel, right? This was part of God's people. They gave themselves over to sexual immorality and had gone after strange flesh. Are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The cities are still there to this day. A guy went over there recently and actually started to find remnants of burnt bones of human beings. They think they may have found a whole, a whole body under all that ash. But it's been charred up and burnt. Very little left. When they, they know that's they know that that was the cities they know it they've proven it a couple of times over now how is it after three thousand plus years those piles of ash are still there that's an example to us to remember to remind us <coughs> you want to walk that path you're gonna you're gonna have something to deal with that's happening today with people calling themselves church leaders people calling themselves faith leaders and leading people into destruction we have to warn about, warn about this. Verse 8, Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Have we not witnessed that literally on television, seeing people do that? We're not called for that, but yet they're not the ones that are called. And yet they're the ones we put into power over us. What? How is it people like this run the biggest churches in the world? And they're following the devil. Verse 9, yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring him against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Michael, the most powerful, didn't even accuse Satan. He didn't do like a lot of these other people do. Hey, Mr. Christian, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Your rebuke is falling on deaf ears. It has no power here. Go away. No, no, you're going to be rebuked. No, I'm not. You're not rebuking anybody. Out of most of the people that have been doing this, I'm still here. Because your rebuke is worthless. Your rebuke is useless. And you're doing it the wrong way. And yet they think they're doing something. They think they're accomplishing something. They're following the devil. But, but they say they believe in Jesus. Yeah. James too. The demons say they believe too. It's more than just belief. The Bible says, believe and you'll be saved. What kind of belief? Look at the original language. What does it tell you? Get you a concordance or get you one of these apps that lets you look at the original Greek and look at that word, believe, and find out what that word is and what the definition is. That will help you understand what kind of belief it's referring to. It's free. It ain't like you got to pay for it. But see, this is the difference between those who believe and those who don't. Because those who believe want to know more and they will go and strive after that. Those who are still struggling, those who may not even believe at all, they won't. They don't want their belief challenged. It's unfortunate, but it's the reality. It's the apostasia. Verse 10, this is a key verse too. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know. Let me highlight this. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know. They don't understand it, so they speak evil about it. If they don't understand it, they, they, they speak evil about it. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things, they corrupt themselves. I'm not being condemned by any of this stuff. They condemn themselves by their very words, by their very actions. Hello? Because what they do doesn't glorify God. The way they present this doesn't glorify God. You have to do it in a way that glorifies God. How do you do that? Keep it in the word. Verse 11. You keep your opinion out of it. Verse 11. Woe to them. Woe to them. To who? 
Well, he's warning the church, the called, the true believers, against the people that have been put into positions over them, the people that are in positions of leadership, the ones that are causing division and dissension. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Cain murdered Abel. They have hatred, and hatred is murder. There's no eternal life abiding in a murderer. There's no eternal life abiding in someone who has hatred for their brethren. They have gone the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit. Check the description for links to donate to my ministry. Make sure you tithe. They have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. <laughs> apostates depraved and doomed. These are apostates. They're apostasia. That's why they don't believe what the Bible says and instead want to denounce and condemn anybody that disagrees with them. I don't care if somebody disagrees with me or not because I can take you to the scripture and show you the correct understanding. It's up to you to believe it. There's nothing to do. There's nothing between me and you. It's between you and the Lord. Verse 12, these are spots in your love feasts. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, Carried about by the winds, every wind of doctrine. Laid out on trees without fruit, they're bad trees. Twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. Keep in mind the context here is he's talking to believers about supposed believers. If this warning wasn't in the Bible, I could see people getting upset at what I say. But these warnings are throughout the Bible. The examples of it are in the Old Testament. The explanations of the examples are in the New. We have to listen to this. And we must address it. Otherwise, how will we know what to avoid? Take ten different car companies. Bring us your best car. Line them all up in a parking lot. Bring 100 people in. Which one's the best? You put your hand on the one that you think is the best. And then you go look at the stats and then look at all the uh, testing that's been done to find out which one is the best. How many people do you think are going to pick the best one? They're going to pick the prettiest one. They won't pick the best one. Most people don't know because they don't do the research. How do we know what we're believing is true unless we look at it, do research, examine it, find out the details, find out the testing, look at the information. See, my belief turns into faith when I study and believe what's being said. Because when I understand and believe what's being said, then I know where to put my faith. See, a lot of people believe and they say, well, you, you put your faith in the Lord. Okay, what Lord? See, there's a lot of fake Jesuses running around. So what Lord are you putting your faith in? How do you know? Read the Bible. The Bible tells you what Lord to put your faith in. That's your action. You're putting your faith in the right Lord, the right God. But how do we know if we don't study it? And this is the problem with the church. They don't study. They don't read. This is why there's so much deception. This is why apostasy has to happen. And it will happen. It is happening. We can't stop it and we can't change it. All we can do is tell people the truth and be ready for the onslaught of insults and attacks that are going to come from people who don't understand the truth and won't understand it. But the Lord is going to fix that. He's going to change them. We can take great stock in that and, and trust in him for that. Verse 14, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all. Those ten thousands of his saints, that's us, by the way. That's the bride. And you want to know what goes on and how this they're going to execute judgment? Yes, they are. We're going to judge angels. We're going to be a part of the judgment when the Lord comes back. Because when you read Psalm 149, it talks about us doing that. It talks about us actually being a part of that judgment. To execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Hello? I want you to look at something here. A little tiny detail that's easy to miss, and I've missed many times. 
So Enoch, the seventh from Adam, verse four, we're, we're focused on verse 14 and 15. Check this out. This is going to blow your mind. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Now the referencing is to, towards these people. These people that are false converts, these people that are causing division, these, these um, people that are um, apostate. Ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, all those people, to convict all who are ungodly among them. Among who? See, we read past that and don't realize he's saying something else. On all who are ungodly among them. Among who? Among them. Among those that claim to believe. Who, but who are really ungodly. Why would we have so many warnings? Jude isn't the only warning. If you're reading the Bible, you know there are tons of warnings in here towards this and about this. Among them, among the saints. Of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, against Christ. Did you know that a person who claims to be a believer and, and actually believes the facts can speak in a way that is against Christ? And not even probably not even realize they're doing it. This is why we do what we do. This is why we warn. This is why we are watchmen. This is why we stand up and proclaim the truth boldly. And we will be attacked for it. There may be, even be a day coming, not too far in the distant future, where they may come and try to kill us for it. If you're one of the truth tellers, you better be prepare your heart for that. Because it could happen. These people that are doing this, and people are following them, will cause them to rise up and go find people like me and you and kill us or deliver us up or turn us in. How do I know this? The Bible literally says that very same thing. It says your own family will do it to you. I say the quicker the better because I'm ready to go home. So if it means I tell more truth and make more people mad at me, cool. I'm, I'm okay with that. Not because they are, they're mad, but because they're convicted to righteousness. These are grumblers. Now he's given the, 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 the criteria for these individuals. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. That's why they have so many subscribers and people like me don't. It's not, it's not because I'm telling people lies. People want to hear lies. If I told lies, I'd have 20,000, 50,000 subscribers. But it's because I tell the truth that I don't have that many subscribers. That I don't have the same amount of views as I have subscribers. It's because I tell the truth. People don't want the truth. The Bible said people don't want the truth. Everything the Bible says is backing up everything I'm telling you. What I'm telling you supports and is being supported by what the scripture says. That's truth. But what happens? See, I'm not talking to unbelievers out there. I'm talking to believers. And what happens? The believers go run to the people that tell them what they want to hear. The lusts of their flesh. And they tell them great swelling words, flattering them to gain advantage. And they grumble and they complain all the time. Living their lives for themselves and for what they want. Nothing else and no one else. It's right there in the scriptures. Verse 17, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. He's not talking about unbelievers here. He's talking about believers. And it is impossible, near impossible, for most people to even consider or fathom the thought that a believer could be condemned. The Bible says they can be. The Bible says many of them will be. See, the problem isn't on the Bible, and the problem isn't on the Lord. The problem is on us, because we're unwilling to admit it. We're unwilling to accept it. We're unwilling to read his word for what it says and say, okay, if you said that's how it's going to be, that's how it's going to be. Uh, I don't like it, but I believe it. I don't like that most of the people I see every day and love and care about might not make it to heaven. I don't like that. That does not bring me joy in any way, shape, or form. My joy comes knowing that I am saved and that I will stand with the Lord. But it kills me. I mentioned it this morning. It kills me. It pains me. 
physically to know that there are people that I hug and embrace that might not go and they might end up in hell. And I don't know how to deal with that, but I do know that what the Lord said about all of that is true. I do know that what the Lord's word says about these things and about these people is true. I take consolation in that as much as I may not like what, <laughs> what the possibilities are. I take great consolation in trusting in the Lord and knowing that justice will be done. I have nothing else. See, if I look to myself, there's no satisfaction. But if I look to him, there's all satisfaction. This is something each one of us as a believer individually has to come to terms with. And I'm just like you. I don't like it either. But it's still the truth. It's still reality, and it's a reality we live in every day. Verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Notice that's action. Praying in the Holy Spirit, that's an action. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some, have compassion, making a distinction. But others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Sometimes, I do the first one having compassion. Sometimes, like now, I do the other one. In fact, in this video, I'm doing both. But I do the other one. Put the fear of God in them. Pull them out of the fire. Grab them by the hair and jerk them out of the fire. And they're going to holler and yell, but they're going to be saved. Again, I would much rather spend a hundred years apologizing for offending you into heaven than to spend an eternity knowing I could have done more and didn't do enough and went to heaven with blood on my hands. I, and if I go to heaven with blood on my hands, I will not deny the Lord my punishment. Lord, I deserve this. I deserve to be punished because I didn't do enough. But I don't want to do that. So I'm going to say as whatever I have to say, even if it means it hurts people's feelings. What I don't want is people to turn away and not examine it and look closer to see if the Lord might reveal something to them. Because as believers, that is all of our responsibility. Verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence, for the presence of his whole glory with exceeding joy to our God and Savior, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. We must put our faith and trust, put an action word, our faith and trust in God and Christ Jesus for everything. And we act on on that faith at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Internal, our changing and our, our will and everything aligning it with His. External, what we do for others. And spiritual, prayer, supplication. We see sin in our lives and we run from it. We, the Bible says flee from sexual immorality. The word flee is a verb. It literally is throwing your hands up in the air and running away screaming. Flee! Run! Get out of here! Run like the wind! But what is the response when you give this truth? You're a liar. You're a false prophet. You're a false teacher. Um, you're not saved. You can't have regeneration. You're backloading works. Um, you're uh, preaching this, that, and the other, and you're going to hell. I don't care. Your words have no effect on me. The truth does have an effect on me. And I would be super impressed to see some of these people actually sit down and say, you know what, I actually think I made a mistake because this is what the Bible says, and I haven't been giving that to you. And so I want to change what I've been doing. And I want to give you the real truth. I don't want them to stop preaching. I want them to start preaching the truth. The real truth. Address the issues. Stop making all this a personal attack on an individual. And both ways, either way. And make it into an opportunity for us to grow. Because the, we just read it in Jude. We're supposed to grow. What does he say? Verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Do you build by sitting in a chair and doing nothing? No. Building is an action word. You do something. 
It's not backloading works. It's doing what the Bible tells you to do. It's doing what the Word of God says you do. And so many people have gotten... Here's the really terrible thing. And, and I encourage so many people to start doing videos because they thought they wanted to. Many of them have gone into a place where they just repeat what other people say. They don't even speak anything new anymore. They don't speak from their heart. It's just the same stuff regurgitated. They find the stuff that they can use that they're able to generalize without getting too specific to implicate themselves, and they just keep regurgitating it, and every other channel follows suit. They just keep regurgitating it over and over and over again. What do you get here? When you come here and listen to my video, what do you get? You get it real. Real words. Real emotion from the heart. Real truth, because I really believe this truth. I don't regurgitate what somebody else says. I might quote them. I might reference them. I don't regurgitate that. I tell you what it's being revealed to me and what he's showing me to show to you. What are they doing? The same thing over and over again. Rapture, God loves you. Rapture, God loves you. Rapture, God loves you. Just believe, just believe, just believe. Rapture, God loves you. Rapture, God loves you. They're building the temple. Look at the war. Rapture, God loves you. Rapture, God loves you. Believe, believe, believe. Just the same thing over and over again. It never changes. And then you go to the comment section. And what does the comment section say? Amen. Praise the Lord. You're such a good teacher. You have so many rewards. You have so many crowns coming. I'm so glad I came to this channel. You're this. You're that. You're the other. And it's, the, it's like eating soggy grape nuts every single morning for breakfast with the minimal amount of milk. And the milk is just about ready to turn. It never changes. And it's not satisfying. If you're going to have spiritual food, you need real spiritual food. And that's not just repeating scripture to somebody and saying the same thing over and over again. It's getting into it and looking at what it says. Has anybody ever taken you and showed you, right here where I showed you earlier, has anybody ever showed you verse 14 and 15 and how in verse 15 he's talking about all of them? That they're that the, the saints, those 10,000 saints, the church, the bride, they're going to come execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them. Among who? Among everybody. Among all of them. Among the believers. No, no one's ever done that. Because they don't see it. Again, I'm not special. I don't have a special gift. I'm just reading for what it says. For all who are ungodly among them. Among who? Who's them? It will cause you to have an epiphany. And you're going to be like, wait a minute. Okay, that changes things. And then what happens is you go to other scripture and you start to be like, okay, wait. Now, he's saying this here too. Is that meaning the same thing? Oh, well, that verse now makes sense because I didn't understand it before. I didn't understand who he was referring to. Now I do. Hmm. That's God peeling these scriptures open to show us things. Those who are willing, he will reveal the truth to. If you ask with a pure heart, he will reveal understanding to you. That is the only way you can grow in sanctification is by understanding. Sadly, most don't have this. It's unfortunate, but it's the way things are. And we can't change it. I have to be brutally honest here. We can't. We can't change their mind. God has to change their mind. But we can make sure that we're presenting the truth as much as we can. We can hold up the billboard, the billboard, the signs. We can, hey, whatever effect it's going to have, I don't know. But we can try. And I have to try. I can't not try. Oh, they're going to make all kinds of videos about this. They're going to go nuts with it. They're going to say all these things, backloading words, yada, yada, yada. It's the same old argument. It never changes. And it has... It has no more authority than it had the first time they did it. It is irrelevant. And no, I don't care. Because I'm talking about it doesn't mean I went and watched it. I haven't seen anything. I don't watch anybody else's videos like that. There are very few people's videos I watch. Because if I'm just going to get the same regurgitated garbage every time, it's not worth going to. It's not spiritual. I want the spiritual Give me what your spirit is saying to you. Talk to me about what you've seen. Tell me what the Lord is showing you. That we can talk about. That we can work with. That's fellowship. 
Not somebody who comes in with a Bible with a bunch of marks in it and a bunch of highlighted stuff in there and they've never once read anything they've touched. I know a lot of people like that. Oh, they got it. Oh, oh look, at, look at how tore up his Bible is. Yeah, he probably bought it at the bookstore, almost that condition. The used bookstore. And all he's done is just worn it out and everything. Like, that's supposed to mean something. And I know people who will do that. They'll carry around the, the, the most wretched looking Bible you've ever seen. Like, it means something. Oh, look how much he reads his Bible. And yet, they don't realize that when they invite me to their house and I see them get the other Bible out that they, that they normally read. They carry that Bible around for show. It's fake. It's frustrating. And I'm not angry. It's frustrating. Like I said the other night, what do we do? What do we do? We just keep giving them the truth. We keep giving them the truth and we keep plugging away. We keep rowing upstream. The, the, the analogy of the canoes is so appropriate. Imagine a river. This is what I'm going to close with. Imagine a river. People on the bank... They know the river will take them to freedom. They know the river will take them to safety, but they don't get in. They don't trust the river. That's your unbelievers. Some people, quite a few actually, get in canoes and get in the river and float downstream. These are believers. They believe the river will take them to freedom, yet they don't understand what's going on or where the freedom is. They don't understand the details. They just know, okay, well, they said this would take me to freedom. I'm going to take it, and they're floating downstream. Every now and then, a couple of canoes will pa pass them going upstream. Hey, where y'all going? We're going upstream. Why? Just float. The safety's upstream, not downstream. There's a waterfall downstream. There's rapids downstream. It's a big, wide one, too. And it goes into a really, really, really deep hole. Nah, that's not what everybody's been saying. Well, we're going upstream. That's where the safety is. See, those are the converted believers. They've come to the understanding there's a waterfall down and we can't go this way. That's the wide path. we got to go the other way. we got to go up to the headwaters. That's the narrow path because a river gets narrower and shallower the further up to the headwaters you go. Y'all aren't going to make it. We're going to try. See, Jesus is upstream. The narrow gate is that narrowing river going upstream to the headwaters. And that's that narrow way. The wide way is downstream. It's the easy way. It's the easy path. And then many are just going to float right to their destruction. They believe the river is, this, is the river, the path to safety, but they don't understand anything. They don't act on that faith. They just sit in a boat, eating chips, drinking soda, floating down the river, looking at the leaves and the scenery, watching the squirrels run around the trees. And then they go over the waterfall. Even after being warned, the other ones realize the truth. And they took off the other direction. And are they going to get tired? Oh, yeah. Are they going to have to sw swap out and other people are going to have to do the rope? Yeah. But there's action involved. They're rowing. They're moving. Moving toward the Lord. That's your real believers. The Bible describes this. Not as the canoe analogy, but it describes this. Wide is the path of destruction, and many there are that find it. Narrow is the path to salvation, and few there are that find it. Where is that path? Right here. You're looking at it. Where is that gate? Right here. You're looking at it. And if we can't stay in this word, we can't stay on the path. It's literally that easy. All right. Thank you guys for watching. I know this is this stuff is ruffling feathers, but you know, sometimes we got to stir everything up a little bit. Sometimes we got to wake people up. And I firmly believe there's been more confirmations of this that the Lord is trying to get everybody as awake as possible. He's trying to stir everybody up and get them to look. Hey, I'm about to arrive. Y'all need to be looking at where you're standing. What are you doing? How are you doing it? Is what you're doing matching scripture? Because once I come, and you're not going to see me, because I'm going to be up in the clouds. Once I come, I'm taking those that are mine, those that are found worthy, and everybody else is staying here. And right away, people get upset. No, 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 you're wrong. All believers are going. No, all believers are not going in the rapture. There's no, and it's not a partial rapture. It's because they weren't ready. Because they were walking and practicing sin. They were going the other direction. They weren't going to him. 
They weren't rowing upstream. You see, when we're rowing upstream, you don't have to row all the way. At a certain point, he has a haul out, and you get out, and he takes you the rest of the way. Come on, guys. Here's the bus. Put the canoes on the trailer. I'll take you all up there. That's the rapture. But you got to be there when it happens. For us, that's living a life for him. Moving in faith. Doing the word. It says, don't be a hearer of the word only. Be a doer of the word. The word do is a verb. It's an action. And what people, what do people do? They fight against it. They read those very scriptures and fight against them. Their only thought is to curse and condemn. Well, that kind of hatred, what is that going to do for you? Because the Bible says if you have that kind of hatred in you, for your brothers and sisters, you're considered a murderer according to Christ, and no murderer has eternal life abiding in it. The scripture literally says that. Do you think he's going to take somebody like that to heaven? No, absolutely not. The Bible says people like that don't go to heaven. They have no eternal life. See, this is the year of edification for the true believers. This is the year of conviction for those that aren't. This is the year for people to hear the warnings and to get woken up and to get shaken, pulled out of the fire. Unfortunately, there's a tiny, tiny handful of people doing this. Tiny. And it, our population is actually getting less because people are apostatizing. The Bible said it was true and I knew it was coming, but it still doesn't make it any less harder to see it, to witness it happen. And I pray, Lord, why, why are so many wandering away when they can see the truth? Satan's growing in power. He knows his time is here. He's doing everything he can to drive as many as he can into the darkness because his whole goal, knowing he's not going to win, he knows he's not going to win, but his whole goal is to destroy as many as he can. And the only way we get out of that is by following this word to the letter. Do what the Lord said. Simple. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate all y'all watching and commenting and sharing what you think on this. Like I said, I'm not going to block anybody for that. You share what you think. Give me your opinion. I'm not going to condemn anybody for that. But just remember, if you're speaking on his behalf, that means you're representing him, and that means there's a standard you have to hold to in that representation. I'll see you all in the next video.